So it's three o'clock. It's a great, great pleasure for me to uh, really welcome this, uh, and it's the first time for me, uh, to, to welcome a professor here for this presidential lecture series. And uh, it, uh, the series started, uh, I think, in 2018, to really invite uh, prestigious pre uh, professors here to, to engage a larger community like you know, it lives in the in the culture of uh, of OIST and develop it further across the different disciplines, and uh, and I think uh, we have had a good series of these type of uh, of lectures, and uh, we are going to enjoy one, I am sure, here today as well. And so it is, uh, it's, as I said, it's a real pressure for me to uh, to also be able to say uh, thank you and welcome to uh, to Professor Sid Nigel from the uh, University of Chicago. And I think it's uh, you are an example of uh, definitely a, a professor that can live up to this uh, engagement and uh, to, uh, to really spread the excitement of science. And you have also, when you're here, and as I hope that most of the presidential lectures are uh, also giving more to specific the science discussions uh, during your time that you visit. And I hope that that's going to inspire also more uh, collaborations and that you will be a little bit of an ambassador for us to get people to come over here more and more. So, so th I want to thank you for that and uh, I just want to give now the word over to the host for this uh, lecture. So this is uh, the Professor Meshi Bandi that is from Soft Matter Physics and uh, please take it over. Thank you, President Makedis. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mahesh. I'm on the faculty here at OIST. Uh, there's, a, there's a puzzle I, I try to solve uh, whenever I come in contact with any scientist, which is to figure out their one trick. I believe each one of us is a one trick pony, and I'm trying to figure out what is the scientist's one trick. And in case of Professor Sid Nagel, I must admit failure. He defies classification. I couldn't figure out his one trick because Sid works in a variety of stuff, from fluids to granular materials. But uh, the most impressive thing about uh, Sid is perhaps how he takes commonplace phenomena and elucidates uh, or uh, shows us a view of the world we, we did not observe. Uh, because these phenomena are commonplace, we, it's like familiarity breeds contempt, but not quite contempt in this case. Uh, because we see them in common set, commonplace settings, we assume we n understand them. But there's a difference between knowing and understanding. And that is where uh, Sid brings a point of view and shines light on a view of the world that uh, we have missed. And uh, by way of a more formal introduction, Professor Nagel is the Steinfreiler Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, he received his bachelor's from the Columbia, University of Columbia. Uh, sorry, Columbia University. University of Columbia would be in Columbia. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, his PhD was from Princeton, and uh, he, uh, uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Brown University, uh, follow, following which uh, he moved to University of Chicago, which has been his academic home ever since. Uh, his uh, contributions to science have been recognized with several honors. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, he is an elected fellow of the National Academy of Sciences of the USA and the American Philosophical Society. Uh, he has won the uh, Oliver Buckley Prize in Condensed Matter Physics given by the American Physical Society. And most recently, he was awarded the APS Medal for Distinguished Achievement, uh, uh, Distinguished Research Excellence. Uh, He's an excellent educator, and uh, we are actually uh, lucky to have uh, one of his uh, most recent mentees as a postdoc in my group. So I don't want to keep you uh, boring with uh, my spiel. Uh, I want to hand over to Sid, and uh, he has some demos for us as well. So we are definitely going to be entertained. I hope we learn something as well. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you, uh, President Marquitas, and uh, also, uh, Mahesh, for uh, incredible 
um, hosting here for the past week. And so it's really been a great pleasure to be here. Um, what I'd like to tell you about today is some work that we've been doing over the years on patterns and structures formation in, in nature. And so what I want to be specifically talking about is how the structure emerges. So it's going to be a little bit focusing on dynamics of what happens. And so the, in, the focus will be on instabilities and the singular dynamics that creates these uh, patterns and structures that I'm going to be telling you about. So the uh, first thing I should uh, say is, well, it's all these things are going to be done in fluids. And so I should just give you a uh, just a tiny little uh, flavor of w why fluids are so important to us and, and to me in my lab. And the first thing is that uh, fluids are a test bed for a whole bunch of basic issues in science. And so I can't think of more basic I I uh, issues than uh, how do we understand disordered matter? We're really good at physicists at understanding crystals and things that are very well ordered, but when it comes to disorder, we get kind of stuck and we don't really know what are the principles for how do we study this. Another question would be how do you study things that are very nonlinear? So you have transitions, dynamic transitions, singularities, which I'll be uh, talking a little bit about today. These are again things which are a little bit farther from what we are typically taught in our physics courses. The one that I'm most fond of is the third one here, which is far from equilibrium behavior. And you know, if you think about that, uh, physicists really know a lot about equilibrium phenomena. And so if I gave you a box of gas, I would be able to tell you everything about that box of gas. I mean, and, you know, bore you stiff with everything I could tell you about it because it's in equilibrium. And we know how to treat things that are in equilibrium. But most things around us are not in equilibrium. I mean, you look outside, the atmosphere is not in equilibrium. I look out at, at you, and I see all of you, and uh, you're not in equilibrium. Um, if you were in equilibrium, you'd be dead. And that would be a very boring kind of existence. So it's being far from equilibrium that allows biology. And you would think that, so one way of thinking about biology is to say it's what's necessary to prevent us from reaching equilibrium behavior. And so in all of this, you get patterns. And I also want to emphasize that these fluids actually are important because they also appear on all length scales. And so you can think at the smallest scale, the quark gluon plasmas, or you, that's shown to be a, a liquid-like behavior. Uh, you go up, and uh, Bohr told us that the nucleus of an atom was a liquid drop. You can uh, go out into you know, space, and you see gas clouds. And, and these are, again, things where the stars are formed. And so you get this from the cosmological down to the uh, really uh, elementary particle behavior is where fluids occur. And then another thing that's important uh, to, to a lot of the work and what we've been hearing about in our conference uh, this week has been rigidity formation. And you get flow versus rigidity in fluids. And so you can go from the gas to the glass, where, again, this thing becomes stationary and you can no longer move the particles. And so um, these are some of the reasons why fluids are such a great test bed for so many different kinds of physics. What I'm particularly interested in here is that they also are a great place to see surprises. And these are the surprises that are all around us. And they really, these behaviors of the fluid are what give us what I like to call the texture of our world. It's a texture which you know, makes it interesting to us. And so it's elegant. And this elegant evokes appreciation. And then there's this quote from uh, Plato that philosophy begins in wonder. And I like to think that, well, physics also begins in wonder, at least physics in of the kind of variety that uh, I'm involved in. And so this is part of why I think this is such a wonderful subject to be uh, able to tell you about today. So I'm going to start off with one kind of structure formation. And so uh, this is what's called dilation symmetry and penetration of space. And so you see this in many different guises. And so what is the point here as well? You 
take something like this tree pattern and you look in closely and if you expand that back out to the size of this whole photograph, you're not really sure whether you're looking at the small part of the tree or the larger tree. These things are similar at these different scales. This on the right is a river network, again, taken from some altitude. I don't know which, what altitude, but again, if you focused in closer, you would see finer and finer rivulets. Your blood vessels also have something of this behavior in it, and then lightning strikes, of course. So um, what I want to uh, tell you about or show you is another kind of um, um, behavior, and so this, uh, where, where this appears, and so this is in uh, this piece of plastic, and I'll, I'll try to show this to you in, in a minute, but what was done to this piece of plastic was that this plastic was stuck at the front end of an electron accelerator, and it was bashed with electrons. So this thing was totally filled with electrons, and then at this point here, you see a, a tiny little hole where someone had stuck a nail into this and then grounded it. And all those electrons were repelling each other and tried to get out as fast as they possibly could, and they created this pattern. And so, uh, I don't know if you can uh, see that. So uh, here is where they're coming out, whoops, here. And you see all of these patterns from here, all ending up at the end point. But if you look at closer, you'll see that, oh, you can see, you know, it really gets fine feathered things, feather, more and more of these things as you look closer and closer into this uh, block of material. And so maybe uh, I'll just pass this around so that you can all see it. But it's really a gorgeous piece of physics. So one of the things that we wanted to do was, okay, if you have that as something that you can show people and you try to get them excited in, in science, so you show uh, someone in a science museum, something like that, they might think that's really beautiful and want to do it, but we don't have an electron accelerator for them to play with and make their own. So that was something that we wanted to do, was to figure out how could we get uh, a, um, you know, people to be able to make their own patterns that had something of that kind of shape. And so the idea here was, well, we can do this with fluids. And so what I'm going to do here is perhaps the world's most boring experiment. And so uh, I take this uh, plastic sheet, and I'm going to take another plastic sheet, and I'm going to put it on top of it. And the most boring part of the experiment is this. Look, it just goes out in this really, really boring circle, right? disk. How could be more boring than that? But the less, oops. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> you didn't see that. <laughs> okay, uh, you can see that what you were able to get here is a whole set of patterns that come out in the same kind of behavior as we just saw in the, uh, in, in the case of those, the thing that I'm passing around, which is called Lichtenberg figures. Okay, so this is a way of being able to uh, see uh, these patterns. Let's see if it. Okay, and so this is a, a way of being able to see these patterns and you get them right in front of you and you can make them yourself. It's easy, uh, you can go home tonight with just butter between two glass plates and pull it apart and you'll get something very similar to what I just uh, made for you here. So um, what I want to tell you a little bit about is well, how do we try and study these things at a more scientific level. So, you know, I, I demonstrated this and I want to now say, okay, so what do you get to do? And so the idea here is that this is a 
occurs because there is this fundamental instability in fluids, which is called the viscous fingering instability. And you can see this fairly easily. Uh, the idea here is that you take two glass plates, they're smooth, parallel. There's a hole in the middle of one in which you inject the fluid. So there's an outer fluid here, and there's an inner fluid. And if the inner fluid is more viscous than the outer fluid, it does that boring experiment I just showed you. That is, uh, that red blob just went out in a circle. But if you had the inner fluid, the, low, uh, the inner fluid being the low viscosity fluid invading the higher viscosity fluid, then you get that kind of structure that I just showed you. And so here is the uh, a movie of that. So uh, we have already put in the outer fluid, and we're going to put in a dyed blue inner fluid, and we'll see what happens in this case. And so again, you get something that, well, I, I don't know about you, but I find these things really mesmerizingly lovely. And it's unstable. And what causes the instability? Well, it's the fact that I, I to told you about the, there's, uh, the inner fluid is uh, less viscous than the outer fluid. But the other thing that's very important about this is there's a surface tension between these two fluids. And if this surface tension uh, is, you know, what does surface tension do? Surface tension tries to keep things from becoming too sharp. And so if you have a, a lot of surface tension, you would think these things will be rather blunt. But if you have lower and lower surface tension, you would think, oh, it's easier for these fluids to penetrate one another. And so what we want to do is see, well, what is the endpoint of this? So if we took two fluids that had no surface tension between them, what do you see? And so this is what uh, we see if we have surface tension. And so this is uh, a set of images of the, the same experiment done with different fluids. The, the parameter here is the viscosity ratio, so the inner fluid divided by the viscosity of the outer fluid, and it's increasing up to this point. And you see that one thing that's happening is that you're getting this interior section getting bigger and bigger. But now what we want to see, if we did exactly the same thing, same viscosities between the two fluids, but we, without the surface tension, what do you see? And this is what we saw, that you see something that kind of looks a bit similar. But look at this. This is now more stable than the one above. This has much shorter fingers than the fingers above it, which have everything is the same except that it has surface tension there. This has no surface tension. And when you get over to this side, this thing is completely stable. It has no fingers whatsoever. So what, you know, it's, you know I'm telling you this now. And so I, I hope you say, oh, well, that's surprising because he tells me about it. But we really expected to be able to see lots of very sharp fingers and see something about how these sharp fingers multiplied and got bigger and bigger as we went in, in this direction. And it did exactly the opposite. And so this is something that I find, oh, you know, uh, how did that happen? Why does something behave exactly the opposite from what we expected? And so this is going to be a theme in uh, uh, this talk, of how things are constantly able to surprise us. So. Um, what I want to point out is that, OK, looking at these, and you look a little closely, you see that this means that there's a new regime of behavior in this kind of system. And so I'm going to show a movie on the left, which is what we would see for this low viscosity, uh, uh, low, uh, viscosity ratio fluid. And so this is what we've kind of seen before. I show that to you on that first uh, movie, and you see that forms these fingers, and these fingers then break up and form other fingers, which break up and form other fingers on infinitum. But now I want to do it at this other end of the spectrum, where the viscosity ratio is much larger. It's closer to 1, closer to the point where it should become more stable. And this is what we see. And that's kind of bizarre. Look, at that thing, you know, it grew. But it no longer split apart. We got one finger, and then this instability turned itself off. 
and it no longer is able to create another instability on top of the one that you saw. Even though this wavelength is much bigger than uh, when it was started when the f it first started to finger. So this is a uh, strange thing. It's a different kind of thing, and you know I really object to calling these fingers because they're really stubby things, and so they're more like toes, right? And so they're little stubby toes that come out at the edge of this pattern, and once a toe forms, it turns off that instability and it no longer splits and uh, we no longer get this finger upon finger upon finger. We no, no, don't get new generations of fingers forming. Okay, so why uh, is this kind of an interesting thing for us? And so I want to remind you of one other kind of phenomena that we're all very familiar with, and so this crosses over into biology, and we all know about you know, little kids, mammals, they start off at one size, they're born, and then they grow, and they grow, and they grow, but they kind of look the same from the small to the large, from the baby to the adult. And so, you know, here are pictures of a baby and an adult, and, you know, okay, the head is maybe a little bit bigger for the baby to the rest of the body proportions, but basically it's the same thing. And basically, I, you know that after a year or two, you can recognize the baby and the adult. I mean, you can recognize what, uh, you know, which pictures were of any particular individual. And so why do I tell you about this? Well, this is a symmetry that appears in biology. It's proportional growth. That is, everything grows, but the fingers grow as well. The hands grow as well. The legs grow as well. The head grows as well. Everything grows, but kind of proportional to one another. And this is something that if you think about it, well, it appears everywhere in biology. It's, you know, all babies basically do this, in, in mammals certainly. And are there any physical examples of this? And I can't think of any until we looked at this problem that I just showed you with the, in this regime of the toe formation. And so what this is is three images of this pattern in, in process formation. And so this is smaller, it got bigger, it got bigger, and so this is different scales. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow up the red box to be the same size as the black box, which is going to be also blown up to be the same size as the blue box. And if you look at that, then you see that now these things are essentially indistinguishable from each other. You see all the same little bits and pieces around each of these fingers. The fingers retain their behavior. They just all got bigger. They all got bigger proportional to the total radius of the system. So this is an example of something that shows this idea of proportionate growth, but in a purely physical system. And having it in a purely physical system means it's something that you can begin to address with physical concepts, not having to rely on bi biology to be the process be, uh, that makes this uh, occur. And so um, this is the example of, uh, you know, of proportionate growth in a physical system. Okay, so now I want to go over to another question, which is, uh, you know, we looked at this uh, the pattern formation, and it was the interface between the inner fluid and the outer fluid, and this started off very smooth and then became rougher and rougher and rougher as things uh, progressed. And clearly, the surfaces interfaces matter. And so what I'm going to be interested in now is things breaking apart in here. And so I'm going to give you two examples. One is uh, structures on fluids, uh, surfaces, and the other is liquid fission. And so um, the first example is one that uh, I, I, we did with Kai Ito, who is here, sitting over there. Uh, and uh, so she uh, is now here, as you mentioned. And so this is, uh, I'm so pleased to, to get to see her again. And so the idea here is that you take particles and you put them on the surface of water. And so these are fairly dense at this point. And what we're, uh, she's going to do is now pull the upper 
so, uh, puller on this thing, but on the one above to the right. And so that's just going to expand this set of particles that are in there. And so I just want to see what happens. Is also here's a movie, and this thing starts to expand. And I don't know about you, but I, mean, I find that as such a, a gorgeous set of structures. I, I don't know how to begin to describe it. What is it that's going on? What am I seeing here that makes this so distinctive? It's certainly a distinctive pattern, but what is it about this that, that makes it distinctive? And so this is what Kai set out to try to understand. And so the first thing about this was, OK, you, know, you look at that, and you know, it's uniform. It's, uh, it's broken up. It, it has you know, single particles next to one another. If she does this at a slower speed, and so this is uh, coming out, but it's much slower. But you can see, oh, the structure is subtly different from what it is up above, that these things are forming rifts in these otherwise rafts. So this is rifts and rafts uh, of this. And so this is now uh, has the same features, but at a much coarser scale. And so what's going on here? So that was what uh, she tried to do. And so this is uh, the uh, competition between the attraction between these particles and the expansion of that fluid underneath, the fluid surface that's uh, pulling it apart. And so if you look at this, uh, you look at these uh, different pulling speeds, and you see that this pulling velocity controls the, the cluster size of these things. And so you, know, you pull it very slowly, and the thing hardly d changes at all from its initial state. You pull it fast, and you see kind of single threaded uh, sets of particles. And so this is the control parameter, and this allowed her to be able to figure out what goes on. And so what is this all about? Well, where does this lead us is, it, again, something that crosses boundaries into other fields. And so uh, this is kind of a big bang in a bathtub. So if you think about what is the interparticle interaction between these particles, it's the same as gravity, but in two dimensions. It's 1 over r rather than 1 over r squared, but this is a two-dimensional case. And so if she builds this, which is now expanding in all directions, we again get the same kind of features. It's, a, I mean, again, a lovely set of features here. And so this is a kind of another feature that I want to show, partly because she's here, and so you can go and ask her everything you want to about this experiment. But it's, uh, you know, it, it, I think it's another good example of you see these structures on one scale, but they are relevant at very, very different scales. And so you can think of this as a real experiment that may tell you something about nonlinear effects or uh, as time goes on in a gravitational pulling uh, medium. So this is one example of things breaking apart. The second example that I want to spend a little bit more time on is how a drop of liquid breaks apart. And so the question here is, you know, we have a liquid drop. It's hanging from a platform on top. And it's gathering a little bit more fluid all at a time. And so it's getting heavier and heavier. And at some point, it goes unstable and starts to fall. And we have this picture, and if I had taken a picture just a fraction of a second later, this drop would have been disconnected from this neck of fluid here. Okay, so clearly there's a transition here. Uh, from a mathematical sense, this is a topological change. So this is a transition between a singly connected object to two separate objects. But what I'm more interested in here is the fact that, well, what does it mean to break apart? It means that this neck here has got to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink until it's zero radius. If it didn't get to zero radius, it'd still be connected. So the fact that it disconnects means that this neck here had to, there had to be some point here where the radius of this is going to zero. So this is a, the radius goes to zero. And the one thing I'll tell you that we should know about fluids is that there is a difference in the pressure 
inside the fluid to outside the fluid, which is simply proportional to this thing called surface tension, which I already told you about, it's the thing that tries to hold the liquid together, times the curvature of the surface. The curvature of the surface is just one over the radius of curvature. So that means at this point where this neck is getting smaller and smaller, this pressure is going as one over that radius, so it's getting larger and larger. And so at the point of breakup, this thing is going to diverge. That is, it's going to get incredibly large, the pressure difference here. So I'm getting incredible forcing on this thing just as this piece breaks apart. And how do we understand this? I mean, it isn't as if we don't understand the uh, Navier-Stokes equations, the equations that tell us what a, the behavior of a liquid is. It's that they are miserable equations to try to solve. No one knows particularly how to solve them, and so you have to try and figure out what is going on. So what you do with this is you stick it on a computer and you try to iterate it, and you, you, you get it at some point, and then uh, you say, okay, I want to get closer, so you work a little harder to, to get closer, and you have to work harder because you have to get all the points in this neck, which is getting finer and finer, and still keep the, the rest of this uh, sphere uh, also uh, compute that properly as well. And so you've got a little closer, and now I want to get even closer still, so I work harder and I get closer. But then I want to get closer, so I get harder, closer. And you, you see what the problem is, that no matter how hard I work, I'm not going to get there. It's Zeno's paradox all over again. I work harder and I get closer, harder, closer, harder, closer, but I never get to the other side of the singularity. But I look outside my, my window, and there's a drop hanging, and then it just falls. It, it didn't think, how am I going to do this? It, it just did it. And the fact that it knows how to do it, and as physicists, we don't know what was going on, what was important, means that there's an important piece of physics that we didn't understand. And so this is what this study was all about, to try to figure out what is it, how do you treat a singular, singularity like this where something is blowing up right in the middle of your experiment? In this case, this curvature uh, 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 blows up or the uh, pressure difference blows up. And so, again, this is something you know, I want to keep emphasizing, oh, it appears on all length scales. I mean, I told you about, you know, uh, fluids in the nucleus of uh, an atom. I mean, it's supposed to be a water drop. Uh, th that's what uh, Bohr told us. Well, nuclei fission, which means they break apart. That's the same thing as we just saw uh, in, in that uh, drop breaking apart. How does the nucleus fission? At the cosmic scale, these are probably the most famous picture from the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, which are these gas pillars in which you have star formation. In order to get star formation, this gas here had to get compact in another region that had to get compact and nothing in between. So again, that's the same idea of we're getting these two things and the part in between has to disappear. So it's again this idea of that singularity is appearing right in the middle of the star formation. And in order to get the star formation, you have to understand something about how that ta uh, takes place. And so, again, this is on all length scales. It's just that in the lab, I get to look at this at a little drop of water. And that is a lot easier to do than having to build a space telescope. Right? So, how, does, how do we think about this? And so the idea here is that we have a drop of liquid and it started to fall. And I want to ask the following question. Suppose I have a cylinder of this fluid. I want to ask, is that cylinder stable? And you all know the answer. No, I, I just told you it's going to want to come into a sphere, right? That's the, the idea of uh, the, what surface tension is doing. It's trying to make as, as spherical as possible, as less, less surface area as possible, and that's going to be a sphere. But I'm not going to allow that kind of instability to happen, so I'm going to hold it at the two ends so it can't come in. So if I hold it at the two ends so it can't come in, then I ask, okay, now is that cylinder stable? And the issue is, well, if I deform it ever so slightly, can I deform it in such a way that it has less surface area than this one while still keeping the volume fixed? That is, I can't change the volume. The volume of the water is the same, or the liquid is the same in both cases. But is this have less surface area than this? And it's a calculus problem that we can 
uh, do uh, on good days. And uh, what you find if you do this problem is that the surface area going from here to here actually decreases if the length is long enough, if the length is larger than this original circumference. And so this is one of the standard fluid dynamics instabilities. This is called the Rayleigh Plateau instability that is why cylinders or jets of fluid break up into, into drops. Okay, so, uh, you know, have you seen this? And so, uh, you, you can see this quite easily. And so I'm gonna ask you to take your fingers, stick it in your mouth and get some spit on it and... Okay, uh, tonight, go home to your bathtub, bathroom, close the door, make it so that no one else can see what you're doing. Okay, close it, lock it. And then when no one is looking, stick your finger in your mouth, get some uh, uh, saliva between your fingers and spread it out. And what you'll see is a little thread and in the middle, there's a little ball that comes in and that's the, uh, this Rayleigh Plateau instability. Now, I kind of expected that you would all be too shy to do this in public. I, although I, I'm not shy, I don't know why you couldn't, but anyway, uh, you, you didn't do it. So I want to show you what you're, you're missing. What would you have seen if you had done this? And so uh, this is an example. So uh, this is a spider, and uh, it's a special kind of spider. This is called a bola spider, and it doesn't build its webs. What it does is it secretes this sticky stuff off one leg, and when a fly comes around, it does that and it catches the fly and then it does what spiders do to flies. Uh, but what I want you to see here is look at this thread of fluid that is coming down here. It's not a smooth thing. It's all blobby. It's got what's called this varicosity to it. And this is a manifestation of that really plateau instability, this blobbiness that occurs. If you go out in, you know, uh, and in, you know, uh, a morning where there's dew on the ground and you, you see a spider's web, a regular kind of spider's web, you'll see it's beautiful because it's decorated with these little drops of fluid all along. It originally was the drops were, uh, you know, all along this, uh, this thread, but it didn't like to do that. It wanted to go through the, uh, the real plateau instability and coalesce into these little drops. And so that's, again, something that you've seen and as I say, it gives texture to the world. Okay, so how do we think about this? So we start off with that Rayleigh Plateau instability, but then what happens? And so um, I'm showing you two pictures here of a drop in the process of breaking apart. And I've hidden everything else about this to you. So you don't see what these are, but I hope you think, yeah, these two things look pretty close to the same. Thing. They're, they're about the same. So now I want to uncover what's, what I uh, covered up. And so this is what uh, was behind the picture. So let me go back so you can see that this is going to be the drop that's hanging from the top. And this part here is this image that was inverted. So this is actually the top of this thing, and this is that next neck coming out, and you see the same thing here as you saw there. And the point about this, why am I saying this is, oh, look, what started this? Well, gravity, gravity is pointing down. In this case, gravity is in this direction, and this is a cone pointing into this sphere. In this case, gravity is up, and the cone is still pointing in the sphere going down. So it didn't care about gravity, didn't care about the direction of gravity here. That kind of disappeared from the problem. And what I got at the end was this thing which is universal. This thing looks the same, independent of how this drop came away from it, independent of what the forcing was. And so this is, uh, you know, the, uh, the, these, uh, so, so you can see the images in, in time, and so uh, you know, we just inverted it. And so this is the argument about the, how the instability, the shape of the instability has remained the same even though everything else has been inverted. And so this is the idea that something here is universal. 
And so, uh, you know, each unhappy drop is unhappy in its own way. And so, uh, I have here a bunch of different drops, liquids. So this is the one that you just saw. This is water falling in air. This is glycerol, something, uh, high viscosity fluid, 1,000 times the viscosity of water falling in air. And so you see, oh, it's kind of different. It has that thread connecting these two things. Here, this is um, glycerol on the inside now falling into an outer fluid, which is an oil of the same viscosity as the glycerol. And now that has a cone pointing up and a cone pointing down, so it's a different thing. And here is water falling into a very, very high viscosity fluid. And I don't know if you can still see, but uh, in the back, can you see that there's still a thread of liquid connecting the top to the bottom? Why does nature decide to do it that way? I mean, that is a really strange way for this drop to try and break apart. And so what is it that we do as experimentalists? Well, we get to vary the parameters here. So we can tune ourselves from one kind of behavior to the other. There's uh, this, what we get to change here, the viscosity of the inner and the outer fluid, the density of the inner and outer fluids, the surface tension between them, and the nozzle diameter. And uh, at that point, we're, that's about all that we have to be able to do. OK, so this is. Uh, what we get to do as experimentalists and tune ourselves into the region of interest for us. And then we uh, try to see what remains that's universal about these drop breaking apart behavior. And so what I want to get across here is so th there's one idea which is the most uh, you know, you know, difficult to, for, for me to, 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 to uh, think about or get across originally, which was, well, how do we think about it? And there's this idea that you have this thing called scale invariance. And what is it? So um, I was at great pains to tell you about that neck in that uh, thread of fluid going to zero, right? That neck went smaller and smaller and smaller until it no longer had any radius at all. The radius went to zero. That means that that radius was smaller than any other dimension in the problem. It goes to zero. And I'm not talking about the atomic scale because I can't, this is doing with optics, so I can't, I'm not worried about the atomic scale. So down to one micron, it's uh, where I can stop visualizing this. This length scale is the only one that matters. It's going to, to zero. And so um, the idea is that uh, because the radius is smaller than any other length scale, the dynamics is insensitive to all of those other length scales. And so the flow should depend only on that shrinking radius. Now, why would anyone think that? And so what I want you to think about is that you have rain that comes down on a mountainside. And this rain collects into mighty rivers that cross a continent. And then they get to the delta at the mouth of the river. And in the delta, this mighty river breaks up into smaller rivers, streams, brooks, rivulets. And then finally, there's flow between two tiny little pebbles in the stream. And my question to you is, does the flow between those two pebbles depend on the fact that the water originally came from the mountainside? No. No, thank you. Uh, no, it, it doesn't make sense. How could it, we know, care about that anymore? That kind of information at that very, very different length scale is erased. It's no longer relevant to the problem. And that's the idea here, is that because this length scale has gotten so much orders of magnitude smaller than any of those other lengths, it doesn't care about them anymore. This is the only length that matters. But then if you say that, then the flow depends only on that shrinking radius. Well, what did that shrinking radius depend on? Well. It depended on the flow. But the flow depended on the radius, which depended on the flow, radius, flow, radius, flow, all the way down. Okay. So what I've created for you here is a fractal sentence, right? That I blow up any part of this and I get the original sentence back. Okay. And so that's supposed to remind you a bit of what the mathematics of this is. It's a self-similar structure that is appearing in this drop breakoff problem. And if you blow up any part, you regain the original. And so these are the universal shapes that 
you get because it's, they've got to be self-similar at the point that you begin to break these things apart. Okay, so uh, this should remind you a little bit of the behavior that I told you at the beginning of these tree formation, where it, you know, I blow the whole thing up and I get something that looks like the whole tree again. Okay, so uh, this is the idea of where some of this universality can come from. So um, what I want to show, and this is the only picture that's really going to have data on it, and not that I want you to see the data, right, okay, this is, uh, but I want you to know that there is data behind all of these pictures. That is, everything I'm telling you is not just pretty pictures, which, although I relish the pretty pictures, it's that, you know, you have to study these pictures to make sure that you're getting the physics right. And so this is a picture of that, and this equation at the top is that scaling equation that I was trying to tell you was the behavior of this drop breakup. That is, the real radius versus the axial coordinate is the same at different times if I just multiply the radius by some factor and the axial direction by perhaps another factor. And you do that over and over again, and you, it keeps falling on top of itself, and that's what this picture is supposed to show you, is that as you get closer and closer, you keep getting the same uh, singular shape of this object at, at that point. Okay, so, um, you know, this is the, uh, you know, uh, I could continue telling you lots and lots and lots about drop breakup, but I want to go to the next stage of the drop's life, which is it falls. And if the drop falls, it's going to come down and hit a surface. And if it hits a surface, what does it do? Well, typically, it'll splash. And so what we were interested in is, well, is there anything interesting in the physics of splashing? Again, another ha thing having to do with fluids that are all around us, ubiquitous. And so what I want to show you here is a movie of a drop of liquid falling and hitting a plate. What you see here is it's a drop of alcohol. Uh, this distance here is about three and a half millimeters, so it's a small little drop. It's falling from a height, something like this, so it's going to hit this smooth, dry glass microscope, which you can kind of see that gray area there. That's the microscope slide, which it's going to hit. So it's going to come down at a, a meter or so per second. That's the scale at which this is going to occur. And then it's going to splash. And so let's see what that looks like. Okay, so uh, it's an ordinary drop. This is what always happens. It's kind of lovely, isn't it? Well, I think so. I'm going to see it again. Okay, so watch it. It's going to come down. As soon as it hits, it sees its reflection. It hits. It sends out this corona, and that corona spreads out rapidly and breaks up into lots of little pieces all over the place. Okay. And so the question that we want to ask is, well, what creates the splash? So one thing you could ask, well, clearly, how fast it's falling is going to matter, or how big that drop is. Because if you took a tiny little drop and laid it very carefully on the table, your guess is that it might not splash. It's going to depend on that surface tension, that thing I was telling you about. That's one of the properties of the liquid that's going to try to hold it together. And it's going to depend on that viscosity, which is how you know, easy it is for this thing to flow on that surface. That's the, those are the properties of liquid, that, of any Newtonian fluid. Those are the things that we end up with. And then there's the surface. The surface is, you know, is it smooth? Is it rough? Is it hard? Is it soft? Is it wet? Is it dry? And now I've kind of run out of properties of what I can talk about with that plate. OK, the one thing I didn't tell you about is the air surrounding this, because the air obviously doesn't matter, right? I mean, you know, I can move my hand back and forth. I don't feel much on it. Uh, you know, um, air is a thousand times less dense than the liquid, a thousand times less dense than the substrate. It can't do much. It gets out of the way. But you do know that if you stick your hand outside the window of a moving car, you feel drag on your hand. It gets pulled back. 
So what we want to see is, well, how big a splash could we make with this? So if we take this experiment and do this under vacuum, how big a splash could we make? So we want to make the really biggest splash we could. And so what I want to show you is well, what happens when we do that. And so here is the movie that you'll see for the third time now. So on the left, this is what's done atmospheric pressure. Oh, uh, by the way, I should just point out that that white thing in the middle is just that's lit from the back. It's not as if there's any hole in the drop. It's just that that's the lighting of it, uh, that is how we lit the, this thing. So, it, but it's just an ordinary drop of fluid. And so here it comes. You've seen it again. You get an ordinary splash coming out. Lovely. And now we do exactly the same experiment over here. So this experiment um, is, uh, has the same drop of alcohol. It's the same diameter. It's falling from the same height before it hits this smooth dry glass microscope slide. And it's, the only thing that's different is it's in a container now in which I remove some of the air. So this is one third the atmospheric pressure that we have at room temperature, uh, at uh, atmospheric pressure at, in Chicago. So this would be the kind of the air pressure you would get at the top of Mount Everest, right? One third of, uh, so you could live in this thing. You wouldn't be happy, but you could live there, right? That's the, uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so the idea here is that we were going to make this very big splash. So I'm gonna just show you this splash. So this is the big splash that's gonna come. Here it comes. So in the words of I, Robbie, uh, who ordered that? I mean, this is, uh, I mean, this was, was uh, yeah, a surprise. I mean, we fell down laughing when we saw this. This was hysterical. I mean, it took us a month to stop laughing before we said, okay, now we've got to start doing experiments on this to figure out what's going on. But this is not what you expected. Look, I, I knew what, I've seen this before, so I, I, so I led you along. I mean, but, uh, but I didn't really do it too badly because this is what we thought was gonna happen, what I told you was really what our intuition was what was gonna happen before we did the experiment. But I wanted you to feel that intuition, kind of agree with it, and then see that this is just totally bizarre. This is not what you, uh, what you expect. Okay, so the air matters. And not only does it matter, it's a control parameter for this problem. And so, you know, people have been studying splashing even with cameras, with photography since the time of Worthington in 1900. And those experiments, those uh, images that he created were to die for, he, you know, so hard to do that with, at, with the technology of the time. He was able to get these things. People have studied this, but no one thought to take the air out. Why? Because it's a stupid experiment, right? I mean, it was not supposed to happen this way. I mean, the other thing, for those of you who know about uh, gases, I mean, you take the air away and the viscosity doesn't change. I mean, so, so how could that, you know, since the viscosity isn't making a difference, how could taking the air away matter? But yet it does. <clears throat> and so the thing that we want to now look at is, well, suppose you go to a higher viscosity fluid. So it's the same thing. Is this, was this only for alcohol or is it kind of a generic behavior? And so this is um, a, a drop, basically the same kind of experiment. It's just done at 10 times the viscosity of the alcohol, 10 times the viscosity of water. And so it's, uh, again, kind of an ordinary drop, just more viscous, and it's at atmospheric pressure. And so I'm going to show you how this thing drops or splashes, so, or if it does. So here it comes, it hits, okay, and it just kind of spreads out. And so, uh, well, it's clearly not gonna splash, but let's just finish the movie off and see what happens. So I continue this movie. Oops, I told you a lie again. It splashes, but with a very different kind of behavior. That is, the morphology of this drop is not the same as the morphology of that uh, 
alcohol drop that rose up into the air and then broke apart. Here, this stuff is just scooting along the surface, almost completely flat, and uh, yet it still is able to, uh, to break up at the end. And so the question that um, I wanted to ask here was, well, suppose we take the air away. What happens here? Is it the same thing? And so we go down to 20 kilopascals, so one-fifth of atmospheric pressure, and do the same experiment with the same liquid. And now you see that this thing, I don't have to stop it to fool you. It just doesn't splash. Right? So this behavior of the splashing and the effect of air on splashing is ubiquitous. It depends on, doesn't depend on whether it's viscous or not, or how vis uh, viscous this is. If you take the air away, the splashing stops in this case. So it means you will not get splashing on the moon, no matter how hard, hard you try. You might get it on Mars, but you won't get it on the moon because uh, there's no atmosphere on the moon. OK, so there are lots of things that we could do at this point with this. And so th this, again, was a, a long research project that we uh, worked on to try and figure out what was going on. And uh, one of the things is you can ask, OK, so how does uh, you know, the atomic mass of the, of the gas matter? How does the velocity matter? How does the pressure matter? All of these things and figure out, you know, do scaling on this to try and figure out what's happening. So we did a lot of that. And you could ask, oh, the other way of approaching this problem is asking, OK, so where is the air making an effect? So you know, I would have uh, thought, well, you know, maybe underneath. And so we have uh, and, you know, one uh, student looked at the air underneath the drop and showed, well, that's not doing anything, that the drop just comes down and hits the surface without the air matter, mattering, and it just spreads out. And then it starts to splash at some much later time. So it's not, so where the air is mattering is not underneath the drop. So the last thing I want to ask is, well, how about above the drop? And so what I want to uh, uh, show you now is uh, the way we look at the air, what the behavior of the air is doing above the drop. And so uh, we're now going to do a kind of photography which is called Schlieren optics, which is, for those of you who don't know, Schlieren optics is a way of being very, very, very sensitive to small changes in the index of refraction of, an, uh, of a transparent medium. And so you know what, you're, what this is kind of when you look on a very hot day on the tarmac of an you know, airplane thing and you see that you look on the ground and everything looks a little bit wiggly because the air puffs are rising from that hot ground and you see that the, 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 uh, it's a mirage effect basically that is the stuff is rising and because of that things look shimmery. And that's because the index of refraction is a little bit different and your eye is picking that up. And the idea of Schlieren optics is just to magnify that and make that really, really clear. OK, so what I want you to see here is uh, what to look at. So uh, there's this black thing here. That's the drop. That's falling down. That's boring. Don't look at that in this thing. This other black thing is the substrate. Again, that's not to be looked at. That's boring as well. What I want you to look at is the gray area surrounding this drop. And so I'm going to start playing this, and then I'm going to stop it just so you can see what it is I want you to look at. And so if I stop it there, you see that you can see the wake of this drop in the air. That is, it's, uh, you see those gray lines coming back up above this, uh, behind that drop, because it's falling through this region and with a changing index of refraction. OK, so now I'm going to play the whole movie through. And you can see uh, what you're supposed to look at is that gray area. So, so, so let me start this thing off. It hits. So every time a drop is hitting the surface, this is what the air is doing behind it. Now, 
Unfortunately, we analyze this carefully, and it, this, beautiful as these are, this is not what's causing the splash, as far as we can tell, the, but this is something that happens every single time. And so this is the thing that, uh, you know, I hope gives you some comfort tonight when you're in bed and your water tap in your bathroom is dripping and making this noise and keeping you up and you're getting really frustrated with it. And just think that every time you're hearing that thing pop into the sink, it's creating something like this. And I hope that gives you a little bit of peace in, uh, uh, as you're trying to fall back to sleep. Okay, so uh, this is the end of really what I want to say. That is, uh, what uh, I've been in interested in telling you about is the emergence of structure and what, you know, basically that nature is wondrous it, and it renews appreciation of our world when we look at these things. And the other thing is that a lot of these problems have been around for a long time, but the book never closes on a good problem. And so if you look again with renewed interest and renewed tools, you get to see new things coming in, new things emerging. And one of the other things I want to point out as well, you know, there's a certain kind of ideas that I use throughout this talk, and they're basically called scaling or scale invariance, things like this. These are the, uh, the, the, the set of ideas. And they're similar tools and concepts for all these different problems. And that puts me in mind of this uh, quotation from the uh, philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, who said a great idea, and this is the case of scaling, the thing that's been developed over the past century, half century, is a great idea is like a phantom ocean beating upon the shores of human life in successive waves of specialization. And I think that kind of really captures something about what we do as physicists, is we kind of have our set of tools and we can use them over and over again, and each time they come in a little bit differently, but each time something new and beautiful emerges. Okay, so that's the end of uh, what I want to tell you about. I really want to also say who are all the people who did the work in here. And so I uh, showed you, of course, Kai Yi uh, uh, here uh, working on the uh, uh, Rifts and Rafts project. But the uh, people working on that first thing with the uh, you know, uh, uh, viscous uh, fluid in instability, viscous fingering, are those on the top row. Uh, Michael Brenner, Wendy, Itai, Nathan, Laura, we're all working on the drop uh, breakup problem. And then all of these people on this row are those who worked on the uh, splashing project. And with that, I just want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.